Hey friends, good morning. Thanks for joining us for worship. Thank you for inviting us into your home or your backyard or your car, wherever you are for worship this morning. We're so excited to be with you. And I have to tell you, we have clearly heard the Lord speaking in our midst this morning. Uh, Steve is going to come and share this picture that he had and, and then Jaden after him. But it was incredible to hear this same picture from the Lord that was just powerful. And uh, I believe it's a word for us this morning. Good morning, everybody. I heard that. <laughs> so this morning as we were worshiping together, um, I just saw this picture of a puzzle all over a table, like in pieces. And I was just thinking about the world today. You know, it feels like that, that puzzle, it's just all torn up, like each piece um, separated from one another. And, and it just um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then I heard this verse in my spirit and it's revelation eleven fifteen, and it says and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign forever and ever and then i just saw the hand of the lord reach down and begin to take those pieces and put them together again and it all became one beautiful picture as, as his kingdom was being displayed through that that puzzle and then also I saw just um, if you've ever put a puzzle together and you come down and there's that one piece missing. And it's real frustrating because you just spent hours putting this puzzle together. But the, the Lord, I just heard again, the Lord goes after that one. You know, if there's one piece missing, he's not going to give up on that puzzle, but he's going to go after that one missing piece to make sure that it, it goes into that picture to make it whole branching off of that I saw that um, that there's like all puzzles start from an actual picture the artist draws a picture and it can be beautiful it can whatever the artist sees he draws that and God is that artist and he made this puzzle and then sin entered the world and destroyed that puzzle and scattered the pieces and then God sent us down to be part of that puzzle and build it back together and put it back together and after that, more people come because we help other people come and help put that puzzle together. And God sent us to put that puzzle together, so help put it together. Amen. That was awesome. Thanks, bud. And two other things with that, we heard the word willingness, that whatever puzzle piece you are in the kingdom of God, you have to be willing to let God put you where he wants you. And that takes trust and knowing, just like Jaden said, like God sees the whole picture and God has it all under control. And so I am making myself uh, available to let the Lord put me where he wants me. And then the, the fourth thing that we heard with this was to be steadfast in it, to, to do what God's called you to do and to be steadfast in it and not worrying or not fretting. Um, and I just want to encourage you with this. I thought of this this morning when we were praying. In 1 John, it says, as he is, so are we in the world. As Jesus is, so are you and I in the world. So know that God has a mission for us. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And God's will is going to be accomplished. And we are so fortunate enough to be a part of it. Let's worship the Lord together this morning as we sing and as we, we get a vision for who he is and what he wants to do in the world. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we serve a God who sees it all and who is able, even when we might get some of those puzzle pieces uh, mixed up, Lord, you are able to make a beautiful picture. And um, your plans are not forgotten or thwarted. We just thank you for that. And Lord, we want to worship you in, 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 in liberty, in freedom. And so as we um, just move forward with these songs and spend some time just uh, declaring who you are with this wonderful gift of music that you've given us, we just take some time to lay anything that's burdening us at your feet. Lord, anything that might be filling our hearts with fear, um, Anything that you're, you're calling us out of, even if it's a good thing, Lord, we want our hearts to be in tune with your spirit and the new thing that you're doing in our lives. And, you know, when we, when we seek you, we, we just we lay these things um, to the side that don't matter. We just thank you, Father, that um, you touch our hearts and that you fill us afresh and anew. And you're such a loving God that you call us and, and you make these they're just not fair these trades with us where we bring you our sorrow and and you give us joy and and we just thank you lord for your grace and mercy
Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to an end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink?
we just thank you that the altar is not a specific physical place anymore, but that we worship you in spirit and in truth. And we have altars in our church because, you know, they're, they're symbolic of, of laying things down at your feet and of the worship that went forth from, uh, you know, the Old Testament altars. But Lord, I'm reminded of, of, of the altars that, that your people have made to you. Lord, in remembrance of the wonderful things you've done or even just declaring what a place will be like. And Lord, when we, when we pray um, about coming to the altar, Lord, we come to you in the altar of our hearts and we don't want anything on that altar above you. And Lord, we also want to just come and bring those burdens that we're not supposed to be carrying and we're going to lay them down. So whatever it is, if it's, a, if it's a sin issue that we've been struggling with again or if it's fear or anxiety or, or depression that keeps us down, Lord, we're able to lay those things at your altar. You paid the price for them already. And then we sing this song, what a Savior, he's risen. He not only calls us to lay these things down, his feet but he gives us new hope of resurrection and we just thank you for that lord we want to go where you lead us we we want to take risks for you lord we don't want to just be where it's comfortable and safe we believe that your protection is all around us but we want to step out we want to put our foot out lord we might not know exactly what's on the other side but if it's you leading us lord we want to obey you thank you jesus
Jesus. Uh, as we were just uh, practicing and, and preparing our hearts for today, God is so amazing at just weaving together the things that he's speaking as each um, saint contributes. In it. And um, we were uh, just praising the Lord with our own song. And uh, I just really felt this phrase from the Lord. Um, it's a story from the Old Testament where they were headed into battle and King Jehoshaphat called for the worshipers to be sent out first. And it's not how they always went into battle, but the overarching theme is that the Lord is our victory and we need to listen for his voice and to obey him. And so in this account, the worshipers went forward just praising and, and, and with their instruments and with their voices. And um, the enemy turned on itself, um, ran away. Um, the, the battle was won before they even fought with their with their fleshly weapons they were fighting um, with their you know their spiritual uh, weapons of um, praise and worship warfare and so I just felt this phrase not just for our worship team but for our church and for the whole church and I just felt the heart of God just asking and, and declaring send out the worshipers call out the worshipers you know the Lord is faithful. There's been many difficult times in history, and we're living in one, and that's okay. God is still on the throne. He is still in control, and I just feel this call um, for, for all of us to, to march forward in praise and worship. You know, when we're praising God, we're, we're lifting up our eyes. We're looking at Him, and we're not concerned. Um, we're not full of fear. You know, sometimes we start out a little bit afraid, but we're declaring who God is, and that's what we're called to do. The Lord made it really simple, and, and we make it complicated. You know, he asked us to seek him first. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So, Lord, we seek you today. We want to respond to your call as we listen to the voice of your Holy Spirit. And if you're asking us to, 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 to line up in the front lines, not with fleshly weapons, but with the weapons of spiritual warfare, of intercession, of praise and worship, declaring who you are. You're gonna line everything up, Lord. Our job is to obey you and to praise you and worship you. So we wanna to respond to that as you, as, you, as you declare, send forth the worshipers. Send forth those who will praise my name even before they see the victory in the physical. Send forth those who will stand up and be who I've called them to be. Lord, we want to, we want to be those people. We want to respond to you. So we just lay anything aside. We're gonna, we're gonna, um, we're gonna march. We're gonna, we're gonna worship and praise you, not just with, with our our lips, but with our lives, with what we talk about, with what we, with what we um, say and do. We're gonna worship you. Thank you, Jesus. I have heard a sound. And I have heard a sound coming on the wind, changing hearts and minds, and healing brokenness. I feel a generation breaking through despair. I hear a generation full of faith declare. Our song, it will be. Yes, it will. Out of the darkness, we will rise and sing.
take the posture of King David. Psalm 27, this is what David said. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. It's not me who's going to stumble and fall, but my enemies and my foes will. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord for all the days of my life, and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. I will sacrifice. A sacrifice, it wasn't just a little gift, a little offering, but something had to give up its life for a sacrifice to happen. Something had to be laid down for a sacrifice to happen. In the end of this, David says, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Because of my sacrifice of laying everything down so that I could seek the Lord's face, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David said, it's better to be with you than to be anywhere else. And that's our heart this morning is, Lord, we want you more than anything else. Can we sing that chorus one more time? There's nothing. Thank you, Lord, that there is nothing, there really is nothing better than you, Jesus. We receive the sense of your presence that you're pouring out right now. Lord, we know that you're in our midst here in this place and in every home and in every heart that's watching Jesus. Thank you that your presence is not bound to a building. Your presence isn't bound by anything, Lord, but where we gather with a heart after you, you come and meet us there, Jesus. Lord, thank you that in your presence there's fullness of joy, and we receive that joy this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I've got a couple announcements I want to share with you. And the first one, and this is just a real important one from my heart, is that I want you to know that the elders are meeting and we are really seeking after the Lord to to ask him, Lord, what does it look like for Hillside to reopen for public gatherings? What does that look like? What's the timeline for that? And I just want you to know that we are looking at sometime within the next several weeks to be able to open up the building again for public gatherings. Uh, and we're excited to tell you that. Just want you to know that we are working on it. And uh, thank you for praying for that. And I just want to encourage you that, you know, those that are in the position of making these decisions, for example, our governor, Governor Wolf, I don't know anyone in our church that's ever been a governor before. And the responsibility for these decisions are, they're weighty. And so I just even want to pray right now for Governor Wolf. Lord, we ask that you would give our governor and Dr. Levine, Lord, would you give them wisdom as they look to reopen things for the state in a way that's safe uh, and also opens up things for businesses, God. Lord, would you give them wisdom? We ask, we don't know the answers, but we know that you do. And so God, would you give our governor and Dr. Levine wisdom and give us wisdom here at Hillside as to what it looks like to reopen and the timeline for that. So thank you for praying for the elders. Thank you for trusting us. If you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out to myself or any of the other elders, and we will have an update for you in the next uh, next couple weeks. But again, we are looking at sometime in the next several weeks, and I'm so looking forward to being back together with you all. Also want to let you know that the elders have called for a time of prayer and fasting. I was thinking about the story that Abby mentioned from Second Chronicles chapter 20. And it's this moment where the, the nation of Israel, they're surrounded by an enemy that's coming. 
And the response is not to freak out, but they proclaim a fast, a corporate fast for the nation. And they, all of them, decide to fast. And what the Lord does is he confuses them, and the Lord ambushes the enemy army. And so as the worshipers go out, they find out that the scene is already done, that there's no battle to fight because the Lord's already fought it. And it takes them three days to carry, to collect all the, all the uh, supplies of the enemy and to bring it back into Jerusalem. And that's the same heart that we have, is that we realize that there are massive issues going on. I've talked to some of you that are grieving for s- such various reasons. You know people, you have coworkers that are sick and have died from this, and then some of you also are missing out on major things right now. And so it's a big situation, and yet it's not our battle, it's the Lord's battle. And so with that same sense, we are crying out to the Lord for him to move in this, in this moment. So I want to encourage you, today is day number one of a 21-day fast. In whatever way you want to fast, you're welcome to join us in that, whether you're giving up certain food or if you're looking at it as a time of consecration, you're giving up things like Facebook or Instagram or television. Not that there's any live sports to watch right now, but you're giving things up to focus on the Lord. And I just want to let you know, too, that we are creating a daily devotional that you can access that helps us gather together in this fast. Uh, It's going out via email every morning. So if you didn't get that and you'd like to, you can email us at info at hillsidechristian.org, or you can even just write it in the chat and say, hey, I want to get that fasting devotional. Um, It'll also be on Facebook, but sometimes it's harder to find on Facebook. I'd rather get it right to my email. So you can ask us to get a hold of that. Um, And again, today's day number one of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Also want to let you know that we are continuing our virtual meetings this week is that Andy's leading worship on Monday. The Gearhearts are leading worship on Friday. We're going to lead worship on Saturday. Wednesday, we still have youth. And Tuesday is prayer. What an incredible time to join in corporately for prayer. We would love to have you join with Patty and the other intercessors on Tuesday night at 6.30 on Zoom. We understand Zoom was down this morning, so pre-service prayer didn't work for us here this morning, but I believe it'll be ready by Tuesday. Otherwise, Zoom's stock will plummet, and that'll be really bad for them. And the Lord wants us to get together to pray, so please plan to join Patty and the other intercessors Tuesday night at 6.30 for prayer. If you want the information about how to access that, um, just write it in the comments, and we will make sure you get it. A couple other things I want to go through really pretty quickly is that our Jones Ministry Hallway is under reconstruction. We're really excited about what's going on. There's a wall, there's a door that's going up. There's, uh, we're making it safer for all the kids that are coming. And there is primer on the walls, but now it's time to paint. So we're looking to see if those of you that are good at painting, which is not me, my wife won't let me paint around the house, but if you're good at painting and are pretty and enjoy it, would you consider coming in sometime in the next week or two and painting uh, the children's ministry hallway with us? Uh, a couple more things is that thank you for giving to the Lord under this time, and you can continue doing that by mailing in a check to our address. You can give online through our website info or www.hillsidechristian.org, and you can also text any amount to 84321. So thank you for your continued giving during this time. We've been able to be a real blessing, including things like the food bank. We've been able to continue doing food bank um, thanks to your giving, as well as some friends have given so that we can continue doing the food bank. Again, tomorrow there's another delivery at 12 noon. Please spread the word and pass that along and invite people to come and pick up food. One last thing um, is that I just want to give you a quick update from the Blairs. Pastor Steve and his family are on sabbatical, and I saw them the other day, and they're doing well. And I also just got a message this morning from their house guest that's with them, Angelie. I don't know, some of you may have heard a couple weeks ago, she shared that she had tested positive for COVID. And she wrote me this morning and said, it's been more than two weeks, and I got my retest back, and I'm completely COVID-free. So she is free from the disease, and no one else in their family had any symptoms. And so thank you for praying that God would protect them, and God would heal them, and God would bring them through this. So that's an update from them. The Blairs are doing well during the sabbatical, and we're excited for them. I'm going to pray for them now. Would you join me in praying that God would do uh, give them an incredible rest during the sabbatical? Lord, thank you for Pastor Steve and Andre and their family. Lord, thank you for their, their whole life of ministry and their willingness to do whatever you've called them to do, including even taking a rest and continuing in this plan for a sabbatical in the middle of this, God. Lord, thank you for the supernatural rest that you're giving them. I pray that you'd bring such great refreshing to their lives as they continue on in this for the next few months. Amen. And uh, Todd Gearhart is going to be preaching this morning. He wears a lot of hats. Uh, You probably are familiar with them. He's an elder here at our church. He's a dad. He's a husband. He's a son. 
and he does a lot of different things here at church. He's a life group leader, a worship leader. He's set up a lot of our tech stuff, but he's also a close friend of mine, and I'm really excited for what the Lord's going to share through him today. Um, Todd, I know that you're a, you're a son of the house, and you grew up here, and yet you have continually turned your heart to the Lord through everything, and I believe that God has a gift of impartation. Uh, you look expectantly anticipating what the Lord's going to do, and I believe that he's going to impart that to us this morning. So I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to grab a seat up there. I'm going to take some notes while he preaches. Lord, thank you for Todd. Thank you for the word that you've given him. Lord, we receive what it is you want to speak through this vessel and through your word in our lives this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thanks, guys, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, Last Sunday, Pastor James shared about um, the blessings and victories that come from uh, after the storm. And so I thought this Sunday I would zoom in and actually on a, on a particular storm that he shared about. Uh, it's a funny thing about, about speaking, um, you know, I was kind of preparing. I really hadn't talked to Pastor James about what I was sharing about. And I had a panicky thought as it was about three hours into researching and studying this out. I'm like, what if we're doing the exact same thing? That would, would, and I was like, ah. That would be actually good, maybe, because we're get uh, cover it more than once and really get into our hearts. And, and so I called him, and it turned out that what we're sharing is really well aligned. So I love how God works. Um, it wasn't planned. It was just God. So anyway, so I want to zoom in into a particular storm. You can turn with me to Matthew 14, 22. Find my clicker. There we go. So um, before we dive into the story, I thought I'd back up and share some of the context. So immediately before... Matthew 14, 22, there's another story. You may have heard of it, the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and this is the one where Jesus tells the disciples to feed the hungry crowd. And they're like, uh, who, us? Uh, what are we supposed to do about that? And then Jesus just takes over and he does it, right? He prays over the meager meal that was provided, right? The little boy brought those the loaves and fishes and multiplies it with enough left over for 12 baskets, which you may have heard before was enough for each of the disciples to carry on their head. So it's a reminder that, you know, Jesus provides, that God comes through all the time. So with that in mind, we have this huge miracle. The disciples have, are carrying baskets of fish and loaves in their head, and they're walking down, and they're probably like, what's next, Jesus? What's going on? And then Jesus, we start at verse 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of, them to the other, get, go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. Um, we don't know why Jesus did this. We have kind of a clue. He says he wanted to get away. Um, but also maybe the thought of crossing the Sea of Galilee with a bunch of, uh, or, or walking around it, maybe with a bunch of loaves and fishes on your head would be too much. So uh, Jesus was kind of being kind to them and said, go get a boat. Um, uh, verse 23 says this, after he sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Just another reminder, our pastor, Pastor Steve, is, is also doing this. He want, he's going, taking some time to get away, just to be alone, to have some solitude and, and pray experience some time with Jesus. So even Jesus had to do that too. He had to get away with the Father. So we have Jesus sending the disciples on ahead of him in a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee with a cargo of fish and ships, right? And while he climbs the mountain to be in solitude with the Father. Um, I wanted to share some background of the Sea of Galilee. I thought this was kind of cool. So the Sea of Galilee measures um, 13 miles from north to south. There's 21 kilometers of metric. Uh, they might do metric, probably. Uh, 7.5 miles from east to west. The lake's total area is 64 square miles, and its circumference is about 32 miles. Now, I was just learning circumference this week again, uh, helping with school, so I learned all about that. But if you ever traveled to um, the New York's Finger Lakes region, you might uh, see the Seneca Lake, and the Seneca Lake is about the same size as the Sea of Galilee, just to put that in perspective. Um, some more facts about the Sea of Galilee. It's the lowest freshwater lake on the earth at approximately 700 feet below sea level, and the second lowest body of water on, the, on earth. And if you, want, if you like trivia, Bible trivia, the lowest body of water on earth is actually the Dead Sea. So right in the same country, in the same region, is, are two of the lowest uh, uh, lakes or bodies of water. Um, yeah, so it's the lowest fresh water. Now the Sea of Galilee is really, really low. But around the Sea of Galilee are towering hills and mountain ranges called the Gulan Heights, which reached heights of 2,500 feet above sea level. Now, you didn't join Facebook Live geography class today. Let, let me explain. Maybe you like geography, but let me explain why this matters. All right. Um, so I asked a meteorologist friend of mine, um, 
And I was like, come on, give me some, some clues of what's going on here. What, what's happening with that? And she told me that the dry, cool mountain air coming from the Gulan Heights and from the surrounding hills um, and the humid, warm air coming up from the Sea of Galilee combine. And as she said, it makes an intense storm generator. Um, and that's, that's the words that she was using, with the words that I've heard uh, as I was researching this more, that that kind of region, that kind of geography, the, the combination of the two air types, really is an ideal place for storms. Um, and she said something really interesting to me. She said that even with modern-day computer models, like she's a, you know, a meteorologist who worked, actually she worked for the Navy, so her job was to uh, help make sure that the troops had, uh, and the sailors, had uh, good, um, good weather for reports for going into battle, and she, it was really important. But she said even that all the computer data and the models she had and the radar couldn't figure out storms like the Sea of Galilee. It was just impossible to try to predict that even now. Um, so going into this, uh, you know, the disciples could have left the shore with great weather, not knowing that they were in for one of the most powerful storms of their lifetimes. And again, you're thinking, why are we spending so much time on uh, Sea of Galilee and the, the weather report? Well, I was thinking about this, and I, I think that in, in the time that we live in, the world that we live in right now, it feels like a lot of times we're like in that zone of the Sea of Galilee, right? There is such a drastic difference from the elevation of the mountains and the, the valley and where the Sea of Galilee lays, right? And it feels like we're in the midst of a storm or at the verge or the edge of a storm all the time, right? I mean, it, of course we have the COVID-19 pandemic right now, but even before that, right, there was a palpable sense of a storm is brewing, a storm is here, right? There was so much... Um, disunity, so much uh, argumentative spirits that uh, were out and about. It always feels like that's where we're at right now. So um, our political divisions, our disunity kind of feels like an instant storm generator, kind of like the geography around the Sea of Galilee. And might I remind us that Jesus didn't come to make the world a safe place for us to minister, right? But that we, like the disciples, are sent ones, right? The word apostle actually means sent ones. We are sent and we are called to go into the world, to be lights of the world, and transform it. We don't run from where Jesus tells us to go, but we obey and go where he leads us. So, moving right along, I wanted to talk about the Galilean fishing boat. And I have a picture here. This is a model. It's not actually the real, a real one because these are like 2,000 years old, right? Um, but this is a model of a Galilean fishing boat. Um, and to put it in perspective, uh, these are the kinds of boats that the, the, most of the disciples uh, were fishermen, and they, they were very familiar with this kind of boat. Um, these boats are around 27 feet long, 7 and a half feet wide, so about as arms, arms length, and 27 feet long is about the size of a long UPS truck, not the short ones, and 4.5 feet deep, so about like chest high for me. Um, and the boats were flat-bottomed. They were designed to fish close to shore. They were a fishing boat, right? Um, now, the boat design was good for fishing, but really bad in a storm. Think about that one. It made it only suitable for fair weather, but it had no keel in it, right? The keel is the thing that runs underneath of a boat to keep it steady. So in a storm, it would just blow all over the place. Not a good boat to be in during a storm. And while I was studying the construction of these boats, again, hang with me here for a second while I explain, I discovered that they were often very roughly constructed, um, the, several different types of wood were used. They were the, actually some boats that they found in archaeological digs. They actually found some boats at the bottom of the mud of the Sea of Galilee, and they were well-preserved, which is awesome. They found that they were kind of haphazardly constructed, is one of the words I saw described. They were kind of lashed together, almost like they were junk boats repaired and re-repaired and fixed and refixed and kind of patched together um, over and over again, kind of like my first car that I ever owned. Um, and <laughs> they, yeah, um, and they, they may have done the job, but barely. You get the picture that these, these disciples, these uh, fishermen were like, they're good at their job, right? But they're kind of just ramshackle boats, all right? Um, and I thought about this. The way the boats are constructed kind of speaks to the way we surround ourselves with uh, just to get the job done, so to speak. We're creatures of habit. We construct things um, to, to fulfill our lives, to make our lives comfortable from different sources, whether at whatever at hand to create a safe place for us to work or to live. It's not a bad thing to be self-sufficient. It's not a bad thing to have habits or good habits or routines, but we were created to be totally dependent upon Jesus. And sometimes our haphazard construction 
uh, the boats that we kind of put ourselves in can give us the illusion that we have things under control, um, at least until a storm comes. Uh, back to the disciples. Um, when Jesus told them uh, to go on ahead of them, it says in verse 23, it was nightfall. So the disciples were probably in the boat uh, around 7 or 8 p.m. to head across the Sea of Galilee. And like we said before with the weather, they probably had no idea that the storm was going to come. Um, so join me in verse uh, uh, 24, chapter 14. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. The verse 24 it says, during the fourth watch of the night, which was time between 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., uh, so pre-dawn hours or oh dark 30 if you're in the military or too early if you're my wife. Um, no, we don't know. That's early for me too. Don't hit me from the TV, dear. Sorry. We don't know how long the storm had been raging, but for someone trapped in a boat made for calm seas, it was probably way too long. Um, to say they were scared, stuck miles out in the middle of a body of water in the midst of a storm while it was dark, that would be a radical understatement. Um, so stepping outside of the story for a second, how many of us feel like we've had storms in our life um, that pop up with what feels like no warning? You can raise your hand just to make me feel better. Uh, I see that hand. Thanks. Um, perhaps we've been on a fishing boat in a storm, uh, but we've all had, we've never been on a fishing boat, right? I haven't been on a fishing boat personally in a storm, but we've all had storms that have caught us off guard. Um, back to the story. When the disciples saw him, Jesus, walking on the sea, they were terrified and, it, and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Jaden, where are you at, buddy? Say, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. Yes, better than I could say it. And they cried out in fear. I think that's a pretty normal response to seeing some, something walking on water. Just a thought. Um, so the disciples see what they, they think is a ghost. They're scared out of their lives, right? They're in a, in a storm. They're being uh, tossed all around. It says the wind, wind is contrary, but I think Matthew was understating how bad the storm was, right? More than contrary, probably crazy. Um, and there's this mysterious thing coming to you that's not a Coast Guard cutter, right? The only thing I want to see in, on a storm is like a Coast Guard ship with the light and the big foghorn blasting. That would be fantastic. But no, they didn't see that. They saw what they thought was a ghost. Um, interestingly enough, you know, um, ghosts were not a belief that the, the Jewish people held on to. Um, that's surprising to me. Uh, the, the ghosts and the belief in ghosts and the, the dead coming back to life and living on earth as the disembodied spirits was actually a pagan uh, belief at the time. Um, and so it's interesting to me that circumstances can be incredibly revealing about what we actually believe. Um, let me just give you an example of that. Back in January, um, I had a storm pop up in my life that, that caught me totally off guard. Remember, this is way before COVID-19 even became a thing. Um, and I got a phone call one day and it changed um, just my total perspective. It went from things were great and normal to my world was wrecked um, completely. And, you know, it doesn't matter what the circumstance is, right? I don't need to tell you my circumstance to know that you've probably had that same experience. Uh, maybe you've had a storm that pops up. Um, I realized that the boat that I constructed, right, that haphazard fishing boat that we kind of try to get through life with, the boat that I had, the coping mechanisms that worked for me, just couldn't handle the stress. It was, it was a wreck. I, I couldn't eat for a couple days. Nothing that would, would give me, normally give me pleasure, nothing that would get me through really worked. And in hindsight, I realized something really awful, uh, that I hadn't jumped into um, going to Jesus first, but I had clung to all these other things. I had stuck to my boat, my haphazard construction, for too long, um, rather than taking a right to Jesus. So circumstances, those circumstances for me, were revealing of what was in my heart. Um, thankfully, Jesus still met me. I should say that a couple days I was really in a funk. Is funk still a word? It is for me. Uh, funk is, uh, I was really in a funk. I was, I was, like I said, I wasn't eating, but I, I took it to Jesus. I was praying and you know, we saw things turn around. We saw Jesus come and meet me uh, where I was at. Um, so anyway, back to the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Jesus interrupts the disciples' speculations and fears with a powerful statement. He says, but immediately, and this is in verse 27, Jesus spoke to them saying, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Let me break this down for a second. I love to 
study out the meaning of words, whether they're English words or Greek or Hebrew or anything else, just to learn about them. So I wanted to explain this a little bit. And I apologize if my uh, pronunciations are, are weird. Um, but the word take courage, the phrase take courage uh, says is uh, tharsio. This is a deep and genuine courage, the definition says. One definition of the word says that it represents a courage that eliminates fear. Um, another statement, another way to say it is don't be afraid because you no longer have anything to be afraid of. Why? Because perfect love casts out fear, right? And that's Jesus. He's perfect love. And the next statement is, it is I. Well, more likely, it was probably in Hebrew, I am. He was saying, Yahweh, I'm God. Jesus was declaring that he was God in that situation. And finally, don't be afraid. Now, uh, hang with me for a second. Um, it's me fabeo. And phobeo is spelled P-H-O-B-E-O. Uh, it's, it's the word we get uh, phobia from. Um, and phobia is, you know, a deep-set fear, right? You say arachnophobia is the fear of spiders, which my wife has. I'm sorry. She doesn't like spiders. I had to kill one yesterday. Sorry again for those who like spiders. Um, but she, she doesn't like spiders. It's a paralyzing fear of spiders. Phobia. So a phobia is a deep-set fear. Um, now, that's, that's where we get the word phobia from, phobeo. Um, but the word before it, me, it's spelled M-A, is really special. It's special because of how, how negative it is. Um, when Jesus is saying, don't be afraid, that negative, don't be, is really powerful. So me denies the thought of the thing or the thing according to the judgment, opinion, will, purpose, or preference of someone. Um, let me explain that a little bit. So I like to think that Hannah and I are pretty good at managing money. Um, we have a budget on a computer. You know, when we get paid, we do the bills. We call it, we pay our bills. Uh, we manage it. We have, um, you know, things saved. We have an emergency fund just in case. I think I know and Hannah knows how much money we have in the bank. But if I got a call from my friend Damien, uh, Damien is a, uh, works at PSECU, my, the credit union we have our money at. Now, he's an authority there, right? So, but if he called me, and he said, Todd, I'm sorry to say you don't have any money at the bank. It wouldn't matter what my computer Excel spreadsheet says. It wouldn't matter what I think I have in my checkbook register. If Damien called me and told me that I didn't have any money in, in the bank, guess what? I wouldn't have any money. It's on his authority that he said I didn't have money. And because he said it, I wouldn't have it, right? So this is what Jesus does with the me phrase. He says, fear is gone because of my authority. I say so. Now, this is important uh, because sometimes, maybe most of the time, uh, the declarations of Jesus take a while to get from our spirits to our souls or our emotions and finally to our minds and our bodies. Have you ever experienced that before? Like, um, you can know something in your heart, right? Like, I know Jesus never leaves me. I know that in my heart, but my emotions, my mind, um, my body, even when I'm stressed, you know, gets shaky or my heart's pounding or I have a headache, you know, it takes a little while for me to line up the rest of my body, the rest of my soul, my emotions, and my mind line up with, with, with what is true in the Spirit. Um, there's a need to continually get the truth of what Jesus says about fear into our spirits repeatedly, right? Continually and repeatedly until the truth permeates the whole of our being, spirit, soul, and mind, and body. And then to summarize what Jesus says about this, we have nothing to be afraid of because I am, or God says so, and don't even think about fear, because in the reality of Jesus, it doesn't exist anymore, right? There's a reality that's higher than our reality. It's, it's a common theme in the Old Testament. Isaiah says, your ways are higher. Or actually, God says to Isaiah, my ways are higher, declares the Lord. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So God and, and Jesus are in, in a higher reality than us. We have reason to trust them, just like I trust Damien with my money, because he's got a higher authority. He's got the inside scoop at PSCCU. Um, that's a plug for PSCCU, by the way. Um, he didn't even pay me for that one. Come on, man. Um, so Jesus has the ultimate authority to not just deny fear, right? We can kind of deny fear a little bit. Like, um, I can kind of get out of my mind, you know, the, the fear you get when going up a roller coaster. You're like, you hear the click, and it stops at the top. And you're kind of denying fear. Like, I'm not really scared. No problem. I can hold my hands up in the air. But guess what? I'm one of those, maybe you're not like me, but I... I definitely have a fear still, and I grab one. Um, and obviously there's more serious fears than just a fear of a roller coaster, but uh, Jesus has the ultimate authority not just to deny fears, to kind of put it out of our minds and our hearts, but actually declare no longer exists in his kingdom. 
just wrap your mind around that one. Actually, let your spirit resonate with that. Let it invade your heart and your soul that Jesus doesn't just deny fear, but it declares it no longer exists. So uh, join us back in in verse 28. Peter says to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Um, Pastor James mentioned this last week. I think it is probably hilarious. We don't know how Peter, what his demeanor was like. Remember, this is right in the midst of the storm. Uh, the water and the, the waves are crashing. There's wind blowing. It's, they're in an oversized canoe, you know, uh, in, a, in some sort of storm. And it seems like Peter's kind of gullible, right? Like, Lord, if it's you, uh, command me to come out. I'd be like, Lord, I want it to be you. And uh, only if it's you, you know, like, give me some, show me some ID or something like that, that it's actually you. You know, or maybe like if it was a not Dexter Jesus, it's a wrong spirit. You know, Peter's like, well, of course the spirit's going to call you out because he, he wants to, to see you drown, you know. But maybe Peter was a little crazy. Um, and the disciples, you know, were probably watching him with some sort of shock and all. But Peter had been with his master long enough uh, to know how Jesus worked. Um, remember, just the, just the few verses before this story, the feeding of the 5,000. And before that, there were tons of other miracles uh, that were recorded in Matthew and other Gospels that Peter had seen how Jesus would work. So, uh, in fact, somebody said in a, in a commentary I was reading that it's more like a conditional thing. Like, Jesus, I know it's you. And if it's you, only you would call me out because that's the way you work. Um, Jesus, Peter had trust. He had a faith in Jesus to see him through. Uh, it would almost be a natural thought to a fisherman who Peter probably uh, was in storms before in the Sea of Galilee. He knew the great power of the sea, and yet he also knew that God, and, and fully manifest in Jesus, had the greater power over the sea. Um, so actually, Peter might have said something that totally made sense in the context. He knew how Jesus operated, and uh, only Jesus would call him to do such a crazy thing. So let me put a, put a uh, bookmark in this narrative for a section, for a, a minute. And uh, like Pastor James said last, last week, the safest place to be at is where Jesus is at. Um, now, think about the boat, right? I just described the picture again. So you have that oversized canoe. Um, the, the wind and the waves are going crazy. There's probably the fish and the chips, the fish and the loaves sloshing around in the water inside the boat, you know, from all the, the abundance they have from that miracle. Uh, they are probably uh, scared out of their minds. It's in the middle of the night. Um, and yet the boat, like I said before, the boat's kind of our human way of, of getting through things, getting through life. It's our own construction. And even though it's some measure of safety, it's not the safest place to be. The safest place to be is not in our construction, what we think is safe, our routines, our money, our habits, but it's in Jesus. So the safest place to be is where Jesus is. Um, the next word that Jesus says is simple and powerful because it's an invitation to Jesus. He says, come. It's a one-word statement that compels Peter to go from where he is at in the comfort of his own construction to towards Jesus. And you know, nothing separates us from Jesus. It says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor coronavirus, nor politicians, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Might have added a few things in there, but it's true, right? Nothing separates us. Um, the safest place to be is where Jesus is at. So Peter steps out. He's walking towards Jesus, and Peter sees how high the waves are, and he starts sinking. It says he saw the effects of the wind, and you know, like I said before, Peter had been walking with Jesus long enough to be, to see his powerful demonstrations, right? Um, just 12 hours before he'd seen that miracle, like I said, um, and he'd just seen Jesus walking on water. If that wasn't a big enough miracle, I'm not sure what would happen. And he heard Jesus speak authority over Peter's fears. And yet the problem, and we know this, that Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, right? He let the lies of his fears speak more loudly than the truth of what Jesus said. It seems like uh, Jesus, or like Peter, forgot so quickly, right? Um, but we should make, Peter, make fun of Peter because we do it too. We can quickly allow our circumstances to become bigger than our Savior. Uh, Chris Vallotton says a word, he's a pastor at Bethel, he says, Our fear is faith, but in the wrong kingdom. And back to Peter in the storm. Um, 
I want to point out two things that are really important, especially in light of the current pandemic that has swept the world. First, Peter is invited to come to Jesus while the storm is still raging. Uh, let, me, let me say that again. First, Peter is invited to come to Jesus while in the, the storm is still raging. Peter moves towards Jesus and nothing, not even the wild Galilean storm, can separate Jesus, Peter from Jesus. We're invited to come, into Je- come to Jesus right in the midst of a raging storm. Um, oftentimes, and you ever notice this, oftentimes we expect Jesus to fix our circumstances before we can get close to him. Like, you know, Jesus, get me out of this, and then I'll be close to you. And sometimes he honors that. But most of the time, I think that there's also a sense that he meets us right where we're at. Just like he met Peter, he met, meets us right in the midst of the storm. The storm doesn't stop, but Jesus still meets us. And um, nothing separates us from the love of God. And Jesus is love. Only Jesus is big enough to not let any circumstances become a barrier to intimacy with, with him. My encouragement to you in this time, don't wait for your circumstances to change, whatever they may be. Maybe uh, you're, you're fearful about the, the pandemic. Maybe you have lost a job. Maybe you're out of work right now and money is tight. But don't wait for your circumstances to change. Continue moving towards Jesus. Get out of the boat. Uh, second, and we focus too much on how Jesus failed, but not on how Jesus won. Take a look at this picture. Um, this is a painting that's hanging in my office. I love it. Um, and it's just Jesus reaching out to us. Um, you know, Peter sees the waves, right? We're still back with Peter. He's sinking. The waves were huge. From his perspective, they were massive. Uh, they were probably over his head. Uh, he was literally overwhelmed in the midst of the storm. From his perspective, he was about to die. Our perspectives are, are valid and they are real. Our perspectives are what we see around us, right? We say, I'm such a basket case. I'm so fearful. The situation seems impossible, or I just want to give it all up. However, we forget one thing. Where was Peter when, where was Jesus when Peter started to sink? He was right there. As Peter cries out, save me, Matthew records that Jesus immediately reached out and rescued him from the sea. Um, you know, Jesus is there for us in the midst of the storm. We don't have to worry. Our perception that he's far away is, is just, just that. It's a perception and it's wrong. Jesus is very near to us. Even in Peter's doubt, even in our doubts, our lack of faith may make us feel like Jesus is far away, but the reality is Jesus is very near to us. We need to tap into the higher reality that is Jesus. This story is less about our faith and more about how great Jesus is. Let me clarify this, um, because maybe you've read ahead a bit in the scripture. Uh, but Jesus pulls Peter up. He says to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, I've wrestled with this scripture because it seems like Jesus is, is kind of chastising Peter for a little bit. It seems like he's uh, kind of almost in a way making fun of the situation. We don't know the tone of voice Jesus had. I'd like to think that he was actually uh, rescuing him first and then kind of uh, jokingly saying it to Peter as he's rescuing him. But it's still, it's a hard statement to hear even as we're rescued. Why do we doubt? Peter, why'd you have so little faith? You see me move. You see me move all these times before, and yet you still doubted me. We shouldn't hear this incorrectly, though. Jesus wasn't calling Peter's faith inadequate, but just little, like a baby. Uh, let me explain the difference. Remember how Jesus compared our faith to a seed? Um, a mustard seed, if you uh, look in Matthew 17, 20, uh, you, can, you can check it out there. It starts out little, like a mustard seed is one to two millimeters in size, smaller than a BB, um, and it grows to be a large 20 to 30 foot tall tree. Our faith may start out small, but there's a whole lot of potential. And um, thanks uh, to the faiths for sharing this. This is literally a baby faith right here. This is a photo of Alex Faith, Josh and Emily's uh, son. This was taken a couple days. I think he was on his way home from the hospital. This is the picture they took before they left the hospital. Um, So he's quite literally baby faith. This is what baby faith looks like, literally. When Jesus called Peter little faith, he's telling the truth, right? Peter's faith is little, just like little Alex is only a baby faith right now. How how does baby baby Alex become a bigger faith? He needs to grow. We don't expect the same things of a baby as we do an adult, but we certainly see the potential. Peter, in the moment he was sinking, was showing his baby faith. He was showing how little his faith was, and Jesus called him on it. But more importantly, Jesus saw his potential. Peter experienced many little faith moments through the rest of the Gospels, but it was Jesus who called him the rock 
on whom the church was built. And yes, Dwayne Johnson, he's the, Peter was the rock way before you. Um, so maybe going back to the story, sorry about that little diversion there, but maybe you're wondering, how do I grow my faith? How do I grow to the potential that Jesus sees in me? I think there are a lot of parallels between the growth of a baby into a mature and a powerful adult and the growth of our baby faith into mature and powerful faith. Um, first, a, a baby is wholly dependent upon everything. A baby needs to be closely connected with his or her source of nourishment, protection, and guidance. In order to grow our faith, we need to be closely connected with our source of nourishment, protection, and guidance. Um, now, I think it's a, a tough thing as Americans for us to grasp what it means to be wholly dependent, uh, other than when we're a baby, of course. Our prosperity can make us difficult to understand what it means to be dependent. Uh, remember the fishing boats we talked about earlier mentioned this. We can make our lives pretty comfortable and safe, kind of construct boats around us to get through life. That's why it's great to do things like fast on occasion, like we've been called to do, uh, to practice laying aside things, and pr- learn to appreciate being truly dependent upon God. Jesus reminds us of that, that we need to become like little children, dependent upon our parents, again, in order to see the kingdom of heaven. We're supposed to have faith like children, Jesus says. And an example of that is just really powerful. When I told Eli about our plans to be- begin coming back to church again, and our, our process for how to figure out how to make everybody safe, and, and what to do to protect people, he just said simply, we don't need to worry about the coronavirus because our church is holy ground. And what he said in that moment um, really impacted me, that there's a sense of what we can do. And sure, there's nothing wrong with those things. It's common sense to, to clean and to be careful, um, to use the things, that the wisdom that God has provided us through experts. But there's also a, a, a real sense to trust, to have faith in Jesus and to realize that this place is holy ground. So we need more simple faith like that of our children. Even Jesus, fully God and fully man, was dependent upon his Father. How else can we grow our faith? This is number two. In just a few weeks, baby Alex will begin to imitate his parents. Maybe he's doing that right now, I'm not sure. Uh, Peekaboo, so big, uh, repeating words or phrases, dad, dad, mama, or even smiling when a parent smiles, are all games of imitation that impart important skills to a baby to help him mature. Did you guys know that? Like, I... I looked into that. The reason my babies imitated us is they're learning. They're sponges. They absorb everything they do. Uh, it's hilarious. It's sometimes really, uh, it's scary if they Im- imitate the bad things we do, but it's, uh, oh, should I click it? Is that working? There we go. All right. Yeah. So imitation is closely watching someone else and then doing it yourself, right? That's the definition of it. Apostle Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. So imitation is not just a a thing that babies do. It's something we should do, too, to grow our baby faith. No, it doesn't mean that we become robots, only repeating back exactly what we hear without a thought or getting it into our hearts, but it does mean that we surround ourselves with people who have faith-filled lives worth imitating. Um, In addition to being around people who have have lives worth worth imitating, it's important to read stories of that. I can think of... um, Stories of great faith in the Bible. Hebrews 11 is such a great uh, chapter of the Bible that sums up so many stories of faith. And it's really good not just to read that chapter, but to read the, go back and find the stories of the people uh, referenced in in Hebrews 11 and look at them and and read about how these saints of God uh, really practice faith in every circumstance. Also, uh, if you like apps on your phone or like websites to check out, consider downloading or looking at the Increase app or the website. I believe somebody's put that on the link uh, on the uh, Facebook feed here shortly. But it's an app by uh, Bethel Church affiliate, affiliated with them that is filled with videos and articles of testimonies of people who have great faith, who have seen God move in truly miraculous ways. And it can often be a help to hear others and have our faith increase too. So let me just mention that again. Imitation, we surround ourselves with people that are already in, in great faith. If you want to learn how to learn how to heal, Find yourself somebody who's already practicing this. Find somebody else who has faith to believe in the, in the impossible. Surround yourselves and imitate what they do. And look at that app, too. It's incredible testimonies in there. Um, second or third, I want to say that the next thing I want to mention about faith is that we can't feel, fear failure. We can't be afraid to take risks. Um, have you ever watched a baby learn to feed himself? It's a total mess. <laughs> it is. I feel like you need a biohazard suit just to feed a baby because it's like there's food on the walls. Uh, 
yeah, um, it's frustrating to watch. Like, I, I know at the point, I was at the point several times with my three boys where I'm like, I just want to do it myself. I just want to feed you myself, so it's, it's a lot neater this way. But no, they, babies have to learn. They have to learn to feed themselves. It's a vital skill, right? How about walking? Uh, my sons would never have learned to walk if they were afraid of falling. Sure, they may have cried. They may have stuck to crawling for a little, for a little bit after they fell, but eventually they, they, they kept trying, right? And eventually they became walkers because they weren't afraid of failure. In our faith, we need to take risks. We need to be able to take risks. In James 2, it says the faith without works is dead. And the reality is that we have to have faith that requires works of risk. Um, I want to share a story with you. I was in a summer camp um, uh, many years ago. Many of you guys remember maybe um, Harvey Cedars uh, is a Bible conference in, in New Jersey, and it's along the beach. It's a powerful place. Um, and I was there for a week with a bunch of uh, teenagers, and we were getting powered up. Uh, we're getting words every day, uh, incredible teaching in the Bible about going out and taking risks and being bold in our faith, and we were just surrounded in, in an atmosphere it was truly a mountaintop experience if you've ever had an experience like that. Maybe you've been to a retreat before. So I was hyped up. I was ready to go take over the world for Jesus. And, um, you know, there was even a, a lesson and teaching on experiencing words and knowledge and having hearing from God and then going out and, and speaking it out. So I was attempting and, and to try it out. So I walked out with a word of knowledge and I, and I was praying, God, who would you have me share this with? And at the middle end of the lane where there was a guy standing there and he was one of the, the members of the, of the group, um, another teenager, and I said, hey man, I have a word of knowledge for you, and I shared the word of knowledge with him, and I was like, this is really impactful, my heart was pounding, I was like, this is from God, I know it is, I shared it with him, and he's like, no, that wasn't, that wasn't from me, sorry man, wrong person, <laughs> I was, I was really mortified about that, I'm like, God, I thought I heard from you, I thought I, thought I heard uh, what you were saying, and then something really powerful happened, that teenager, and even as he kind of said, that didn't, apply to me directly, he said, you know what, I really appreciate your boldness in sharing that. If we're going out on a limb, so to speak, or taking a risk. And his face lit up. He encouraged me sincerely in my act of obedience. And I don't know if I misheard God or, because I was new at it. I was new at words of knowledge, but I know that at the end of the day, I was simply obedient and trusted God to take care of the results. And that wasn't the first time I made a misstep in my faith journey uh, with Jesus. I pray for people to be healed, and I've seen people pass away. Um, I've, I've, I've prayed and believed for things. Hannah and I prayed at one time for a house that we thought was ours, and the house went to somebody else. You know, we've prayed for things and seen things happen and sometimes not happen. I don't know why, I don't know how, but I know who. You know, this phrase, if that's you, Jesus, tell me to come to you. So we know who. We don't know the, high, the why or the how. Um, and something that ties along with this is, is also that our faith, growing in our faith is a progression. Let me explain that for a second. A baby doesn't go from newborn to running marathons overnight. Uh, it's just not how it works. Um, baby Alex is prob- probably, you know, he's starting to be more active and do things that he hasn't done when he was newborn, but he's still a baby. Um, there's a progression involved uh, from learning to roll over, then sitting up, then crawling, then standing, then walking, and finally running. And just like we can't be afraid to fail or take risks in our faith, we can't be afraid of baby steps to grow our faith. In the book of um, Zechariah, Zechariah is having a vision of building the temple. And Zechariah sees just the, just the level foundation, right? You know, the building, uh, my brother is in the midst of building a house in North Carolina where he lives, and there's just the foundation of the house right now, and it wasn't much to look at. Um, but Zechariah, and God declares to Zechariah, do not despise these small beginnings, right? Uh, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. In other words, you have to start somewhere. I feel like we can get paralyzed and not do anything because we're so maybe enculturated that we have to have a huge step of faith. Like we've got to go from where we are now to, to uh, uh, going to a grave and, and praying for that person to rise out of their coffin. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that because you should if God is telling you to do it. But I want to say that we should also be willing to step Take a tiny step. That means praying for your neighbor or inviting somebody on Facebook, right, to come to the service today. I mean, how easy is that to do that? And that may seem like that's too easy. I should go for something bigger. But no, tiny steps of faith. Take a progression. Don't be paralyzed and do nothing. But we're willing to take a tiny step. Right now, begin to picture what faith looks like for you personally. 
You know, how is Jesus telling you to step out of the boat today? What water is he calling you to walk out on? And now I know that maybe the stepping out of the boat feels like a huge step, but think about what step Jesus is having you take. Whether it's a big step in your mind or a tiny step, do you know that Jesus honors our steps, big or small? Jesus honored Peter, even though he called him out as one of little faith. Remember, uh, Jesus called Peter the rock. Jesus poured into Peter, and he saw him through to the great potential as an apostle and as one of the founding members of the church. Um, don't neglect or despise your baby steps of faith. And for the sake of the kingdom of God, don't freeze in place waiting for the faith to make a huge leap when God may be just calling you to take the next step. I want you to, to wrestle with that for a second. Don't be looking for a large step if God's just calling you to take, take the small step. As risky or as scary as it may seem to us, we need to remember that Jesus is there for us. He's not calling us any further than he's already gone. Do you know that Jesus didn't call Peter out from the safety of the boat? Like Jesus wasn't in the boat and saying to Peter, now you step out first and I'll follow you. No, Jesus was in the midst of the storm and he invited Peter to come out to where the storm was. And so that's the same for us today. Jesus is already in the midst of the storm and he invites us out to there. So I want to end with a question. Where is Jesus telling you to come today? Where is Jesus telling you to come today? Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Todd. Uh, I'm going to ask you to come back and just pray for us if that's okay. But here's what I would encourage you to do. Todd just laid out an incredible sermon and even action points for us. What if, what if you told someone uh, in your life today, whether it's a family member or a friend, and said, here's the one small step that I know the Lord is, is calling me to make. Here's the one small step that I know Jesus is asking me to do, and I don't want to miss it. I want to be obedient. Would you take some time to prayerfully consider that and then uh, tell someone else what it is? Because what happens when I tell someone else is that they're going to ask me about it. Hey, did you do that? I've got a bunch of guys in my life that will give me a tough time. They'll rough me up if I miss out on doing what I said I was going to do for the Lord. And so you need people like that in your life that you can share and say, God's calling me to take this step. And would you remind me of it? Will you check in with me in, in a couple days or in a week? Whether it's uh, inviting someone to, to join us for church or praying for someone or maybe getting involved in our food bank, uh, whatever it is that God's calling you to do, would you invite someone to, would you share that with someone so that you can be obedient to what God's sharing? Todd, will you pray for us in closing? Yeah. yeah. Well, God, we just thank you that you are, you are a God who goes before us. God, that you don't call us to do something that... Uh, you've not already done. And Jesus, we just thank you that as, as we step out today in little faith, that you can take that, and there's an increase of faith as we step out. So Jesus, we just declare and we receive even now the faith that you have given us, the faith that you've already placed inside of our hearts. And we may think it's little, but you see the potential, Jesus. So thank you for potential. Thank you for multiplying that potential. Thank you for increasing it. And God, I thank you for giving us the boldness and the willingness to not accept failure and to take risks for you. You are so worth it, Jesus. We thank you. and We desire to be the sent ones. We desire to be called right into the midst of the storm. So help us, wherever that, whatever that looks like for us, whatever our faith, whatever it looks like for us individually, Jesus, we're all for it. When you say come, we're going to follow. We're obedient to you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for just uh, activating us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a great week, friends. We love you. We're praying for you. If you need anything, please let us know, and we'll be in touch. We'll see you soon.